Good evening, everybody, and good morning to all who are attending this excellent conference from all over the world. I would like first to thank the organizer for inviting me, presenting a short talk on genetics and stroke. My name is Christina Skripnik. I'm a consultant in medical genetics and an assistant professor in Arabian Gulf University, Al Johara Center for Molecular Medicine in Bahrain. So stroke, it's a group of highly prevalent diseases of brain vasculature characterized by an acute onset. And it's very important in clinical practice because it's the second leading cause of death and the third leading cause of disability worldwide. And it's leading to mechanisms of long-term disability. And the absolute number of stroke survivors is increasing as a result of the continuous improvement of acute treatments and specialized care. And nowadays there are a lot of research efforts to identify biological mechanisms of stroke recovery and to develop new intervention and precision medicine strategies for rehabilitation. As we know, stroke has a very complex heterogeneity and high variability and risk it's increasing with a positive family history. Age, gender and stroke subtypes affect stroke heritability and younger patients are more likely to have a first degree relative affected. We know that we have two main categories of stroke, ischemic stroke, that when a brain vessel is obstructed and the tissue distal to the obstruction undergoes necrosis, and hemorrhagic stroke, when a compromised vessel ruptures and blood extrudes into the brain parenchyma. Also, there is a transient ischemic attack caused by a temporary clot, often called a mini stroke. We know that more than 800,000 strokes are each year and um, different type of strokes are having different consequences. About one third of the ischemic strokes are classified as being cryptogenic, meaning that the cause is unknown. And finding the cause of a stroke, it's very important because it will help in reduce the risk of another stroke to appear. Everybody knows that there is a stroke risk scorecard where a lot of factors are listed in order to assess as fast the patient is needing a care. And as you see clearly here, the stroke in a family is assessing that, that patient with a high risk for, uh, for stroke. And um, very important assessing a patient is to check about the family history. Why genetic factors are very important? Because they are underlying differences between disease processes, other factors and the mechanism in the stroke. And genetic factors are those who in behind are controlling the disease processes who are leading to stroke, atherosclerosis, small vessels disease, cardiac disease. And together with the well-known risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, smoking, obesity, lipid profile, hematological problems, in the major non-modifiable and modifiable stroke risk factors, genetics, it's localized in the middle and it's overlapping between modifiable and non-modifiable, representing the fact that genetic risk factors are increasingly recognized as being potentially modifiable nowadays, either directly or through modification of gene environment interaction. In this regard, there is a big consortium called International Stroke Genetics Consortium that was created in April 2007 by a group of 16 investigators from Europe and North America. And since then, there are more than 200 strokes genetic investigation represent, representing 38 countries in six continents. And this big consortium, it's having different working groups. As I said, early onset stroke working group, for example, as, as a mission to decipher genetic determinants, both single genes and complex inheritance of the early onset stroke and the cerebral vascular disease and search for the pathways through which they alter stroke susceptibility. Then the multi-omics working group is, uh, has its goal to generate genetic and omics data for stroke cases and controls and use then novel approaches to understand the biological processes that lead to disease and later on to be able to predict when is the best time for a specific treatment. We know that heritability of the stroke based on the wide single nucleotide polymorphism data research that are coming now from different parts of big centers all over the world, it's very different. 
Similar heritability for cardioembolic and large vessel diseases around 30 to 40 percent, but very lower heritability for small vessel disease. We know that age, gender, and stroke subtype further affect stroke heritability, and family history is increasing the risk stroke to 30%. We also know that monozygote twins are at 1.565 fold higher risk of stroke than dizygotic twins, and young patients are more likely to have a first stroke relative with stroke. Women with stroke are more likely to have a parental history of stroke than men, and genetic susceptibility to small vessel ischemic stroke is around 1.6 concordance rate for monozygote twins and 0.38 for dizygotic twins on MRI measurements. So all these data are showing that there is a big genetic background that need to be understood in order for us to offer, as I said, the best diagnosis, the best treatment and the best prevention. So how is possible or how was possible to have all these amazing insights on the genetics of stroke? It's because amazing and up-to-date research methods have been used, genome-wide association studies, advanced computer-aided analytical methods for statistical significant associations, RNA and protein analysis, and family studies, using advanced mathematical models and also animal models, studying epigenetics, doing exome contact analysis, applying NGS and whole genome sequencing in big cohorts of patients with stroke. About rare monogenic causes of stroke, why it's important to know about that in practice, because as I said, young patients who are developing a stroke are more probably either having a genetic, very solid genetic background, or they have other people in their family diagnosed with stroke. So monogenic causes of stroke are responsible for a very small proportion of strokes, less than 1%, but as I said, it's higher in younger stroke patients. There are variable mechanisms leading to stroke sustainability, and some monogenic disorders have stroke as main clinical manifestations. So in practice, if we know that, we'll be able very fast to put the diagnosis and offer the best treatment. There are other monogenic disorders like inherited cardiomyopathies, familial atrial fibrillation, familial cavernomas that can lead to stroke, not necessarily as a first manifestation. And what is interesting is that some genes harboring causal mutation for monogenic forms of stroke may also contain common genetic polymorphisms that are associated with complex stroke risk as an example of the collagen 4A2 gene that is associated also with increased risk for uh, multifactorial deep intracerebral hemorrhage. And here is a list from a very good publication in 2016 with the monogenic causes of ischemic um, stroke. So CADASIL and CARASIL, cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy, or cerebral autosomal recessive arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy, then monogenic diseases causing large artery uh, and small artery occlusion and ischemic stroke like sickle cell disease, homocytinuria, Fabry disease, can be X-linked or can be autosomal recessive. More sandal are hemorrhagic stroke, vasoclusive or painful crisis, thromboembolism, plus or minus other symptoms that can redirect the clinician to think if it's in front of a classical stroke or it's a stroke that has a different background. There are monogenic diseases causing ischemic stroke of other etiology and they can be autosomal dominant like the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Marfan syndrome, even it's appearing rare. If you have a young patient, you have to consider that and do a very fast and deep examination to look for other signs that are telling you that you are in front of a genetic stroke. Also monogenic mitochondrial disorders like MELAS or monogenic diseases causing intracerebral hemorrhage like cerebral amyloid angiopathy or collagen 4A1 syndrome, as I already said, leading to an autosomal uh, dominant disease, creating lacunar ischemic stroke, porencephaly, intracranial aneurysm, retinal arterial tortuosity and hemorrhagic cataract, and other things. And as I said before, uh, collagen 4A1 um, gene, different mutation can lead to um, common stroke, not necessarily a genetic one. A part of the one that I already presented, it's interesting to discuss that common genetic variants can be found in other genes, leading to vascular development and atherosclerosis, thrombosis, uh, sinoatrial node development and regulation of young channels, like it's, for example, PITX2. Um, 
can be common or very rare variants. And the clinical manifestations um, can be different. It's either a large vessel ischemic stroke, either thrombosis and ischemic stroke. Obviously, there are a lot of other loci for complex form of ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, a part of those known um, associated with rare monogenic disorders. And there are now more and more data about loci associated with ischemic stroke, with intracerebral hemorrhage, and the phenotype associated with, it's either in different type of stroke or in ischemic stroke or in a cardioembolic stroke or large artery atherosclerosis or intracerebral hemorrhage. And according to the studies done, genetic risk factor for stroke can act at various level. Um, in the left side of yeah, this image, there are risk loci identified to be associated with ischemic stroke. And on the right side, theoretical mechanisms by which genetic factors may modulate ischemic stroke risk. So in the moment when we understand what are these genes doing in the big genetic network and what is the consequence when there are variants, either common mutation or a uh, pathogenic mutations, we understand what are they doing um, in the complex um, nervous system and big body systems, then we'll be able to understand better the pathophysiology of stroke. So if you can see here, there can modulate tolerance to brain injury, different genes, others can predispose to arterial thrombosis, others can influence mechanism of ischemic stroke subtypes, either through cardioembolism or large artery ateroma. Ad other changes can modulate the risk of vascular risk factors because they are in the backside of main disorders who are linked with high risk for stroke like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, and smoking. So nowadays there are more and more data explaining um, what might be the genetic background of various uh, stroke subtypes. Um, others that are not yet with defined um, etiology, but time with, with the time, more data are coming regarding um, other genes involved in, for example, homocysteine metabolism, nitric oxide synthase, fibrinolytic thrombotic uh, genes, uh, genes who are controlling pro-inflammation and anti-inflammation in the body, and also genes involved in the lipid metabolism um, control. Obviously, there are a lot of research done uh, in this regard. Here, I presented a research from uh, 2011, genomic risk profile of ischemic stroke result of International Genome-Wide Association meta-analysis. And the study study about um, 1,500 ischemic stroke cases and controls and genotype them with uh, genotyping arrays using Illumina's platform. And the, the results of the study said that there is genetic loading of allele associated with the younger age at onset of ischemic stroke, revealing a significant difference in age at onset between those in the upper and lower quintiles. And using common um, variants from genomic-wide association studies and genomic profile, um, it's much easier nowadays to understand who is at risk and who not. Now, why it's important to understand the genetics of stroke, it's not only to understand how this is happening, but also um, how will be the post-stroke outcome? Because the functional outcome after ischemic stroke vary very widely. We have patients who are completely recovery and patients who remain with severe disability. And obviously genetic factors may influence this variability. So can common genetic variants associated with post-stroke outcome be identified using a genome-wide association studies? So, Research in this way have been done, for example, taking around 12 studies in the United States with 6,165 patients with ischemic stroke and um, with different degree of disability after 60 or 190 days after the stroke. And the GWAS analysis was adjusted for age, sex, stroke, severity, and ancestry, and came out with a variant who seems to be significantly associated with the functional outcome. And this variant uh, was previously associated with the expression of a protein, protein phosphatase 1, that it's implicated in brain plasticity. And several variants showed suggestive association with outcome. So yes, indeed, genome-wide association study can identify 
um, several suggestive variants that are associated with post-stroke functional outcome. And this will be very important for all of us later on to be able to develop new therapies in this regard. In this study from 2019, March, a part of that loci who was um, um, associated with the ischemic stroke, other 29 were being uh, checked. And they use also animal models for studying stroke recovery genetics. And the animal model results support the presence of genetic determinants of outcome and indicate genetic impact on cerebrovascular collateral density and in fact lesion signs. And animal models can also examine if genetic variation detected in human have an impact on post-stroke outcome. And in a rodent ischemic stroke model in a mice, it suggests that upregulating of the angiopoietin 1 and, and TEC together improve the stroke outcome. And angiopoietin 2 is the antagonist of angiopoietin 1. And angiopoietin 2 gain of function mice have enhanced blood brain barrier permeability and increased brain infarct sizes upon permanent middle cerebral occlusion compared with wild type mice. And both phenotypes were rescued by activation on TEC signaling. So this study, it's uh, reporting increased circulation serum concentration of angiopoietin 2 in patients with acute ischemic stroke compared to controls. Another loci is NTN4 that it's encoding a member of the netrin family of protein that are expressed in brain tissue and with function in processes with biological plausible role in stroke recovery, like angiogenesis, neurit growth, migration. So all these studies in mice are opening new doors for possible new therapies for patients uh, with stroke in order to help them recover faster and diminish the side effects. There are a lot of studies regarding surrogate markers for studying stroke recovery genetics. Um, as we know, there are biomarkers associated with cellular repair, reorganization, and remodeling that may have effect on outcome after stroke. So there are more questions into how genetic factors influence stroke outcome in patients with similar or identical cerebral lesion, or which genetic factors are related to lesion volume because the infarct size predicts stroke outcome. So have been some results from the study saying that diffusion and perfusion weight magnetic resonant imaging can be used to measure infarct volume in patients with and without a specific genetic trait, for example, with the APOE4 genotype. And repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation inducing long-term potentiation-like activity differed less between the affected and unaffected hemisphere in patients with uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor um, variant RS6265 or VAL66 methionine polymorphism than those without. And this may be beneficial in less severe strokes, but unfavorable in severe strokes, suggesting that the genetic variation may play alternative roles in different settings. And this is a very good review, Stroke Recovery Genetics from 2016, and you have the link to read the article in extenso. There are um, an image from the same um, article regarding candidate genetic association for ischemic and intracerebral hemorrhage stroke recovery outcome. And you see here, there are different um, variants in different genes. And according to different variants, for example, collagen 3A1, according to different variants here, they are, uh, this gene is localized in chromosome two, the phenotype measured have been recurrence prognosis and mortality. And we see here that patients who have this a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism in this gene, they have increased tests from cardiovascular disease or stroke in lacunar subtype, right? Or the other type of uh, SNP, it's leading to increased recurrence in atherothrombotic subtype and so on and so forth. So it's very important nowadays to have um, a genomic profile of your patient if it's possible. And probably soon this will be possible in practice because it's helping a lot in the personalized medicine approach. So it's not one size fits all, one size fits only that patient. So you'll be able to assess and adjust the treatment according to the particular genotype. Regarding the epigenetics and gene-gene interaction, we know that um, Genetic influence on epigenetic mechanism and epigenetic influence on genetic expression are potentially important targets 
for understanding and enhancing stroke recovery. And we know that epigenetic mechanisms regulating the DNA transcription have a potential role in stroke recovery and can modulate several downstream pathways. Um, as presented in this very good review, microRNA in an ischemic brain area can be up and down regulated during different time points of the spontaneous recovery phase of ischemic stroke, indicating how different biochemical pathways are controlled. So it's possible that the gene-gene interaction also play a role in the stroke recovery genetics. And one example is the study that showed that epistatic interaction between brain-derived neurotropic factor, fibroblast factor, factor 2, and vascular endothelial growth factor genes may influence the stroke recovery. Regarding pharmacogenetic and stroke recovery, we know that pharmacological responses uh, vary depending on genetic variation. So for example, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor class, it's showing promising in stroke, but patients with moderate to severe stroke, fluoxetine plus physiotherapy resulted in enhanced motor recovery at three months that seems to persist around 12 months. So probably the phenotype of 5-HTT um, LPR genotype may have an influence considering the uh, serotonin genes. Also, what it's known nowadays is that variants in um, interleukin 1b um, can be associated with early recanalization in stroke patients treated with a tissue type plasminogen activator. Genetic polymorphism in the cytochrome gene, example like cytochrome uh, P2C9 gene related with metabolism of vitamin K antagonism and variants in VQR RC1 gene coding for vitamin K uh, epoxide reductase are associated with variability of the anticoagulant effect of warfarin and the risk of warfarin related lower ischemic stroke might be increased in APOE2 and APOE4 carriers. And a study of ischemic stroke patients treated with clopidogel showed worse prognosis at six months in carriers with CP2, uh, C19 loss of functional yield. So again, having a pharmacogenomic profile of your patient, it's helping assessing the right drug and the right dose for your patient. Even you, you use the classical protocol, but then you can adjust the dose and increase the efficiency and diminish the side effects. There are a lot of stroke genomic research using high throughput genomic technology, or we already discussed about large research consortiums and massive sample size. There are new discover loci and important uh, physiological insights, new target drugs for drug development, and all these genome-wide association studies have been able to uh, reassess the way in which we calculate and we understand the risk. And is offering now the chance of performing uh, a precision personalized medicine. Um, this is um, a study published in 2019 with novel drug targets for ischemic stroke identified through Mendelian randomization analysis of the blood proteome. And what was the perspective of the study? That from 60, uh, 653 proteins, seven were causal mediators of ischemic stroke including two established targets like apolipoprotein and coagulation factor um, 11, and two novel mediators of cardioembolic stroke like scavenger receptor class A5, and tumor necrosic factor weak inducer of apoptosis. And targeting the scavenger receptor class A5 was predicted to protect against subarachnoid hemorrhage with no evidence of adverse side effects. And what are the clinical implications of this um, observation is that um, this can provide confirmatory evidence for pursuing clinical trials of coagulation factor 11 and apolipoprotein in A, and the fact that scavenger receptor class A5 represents a new target, um, therapeutic target. And altogether, genomic, proteomics, and phenomic data through Mendelian randomization facilitates discovery of drug targets and their side effects. So the future medicine will be completely changed in the view of personalized genomic medicine. Now, regarding genetic risk, incident stroke, and the benefits of adhering to a healthy lifestyle, um, there are these studies are highlighting that it's possible to reduce the risk for stroke and also to increase the, the good outcome after stroke if there are small changes on the lifestyle. This is a study who had a cohort of 306 
1,473 UK Bio Bank participants and have been men and women in between 40 and 73 years, in between uh, recruited in between 2006 and 2010. And the conclusion of the study was that genetic and lifestyle factors were independently associated with incident stroke. And these results emphasize the benefit of the entire population adhering to a health lifestyle independent of genetic risk. So what they found out is that the risk of incident stroke was 35% higher among those of high genetic risk compared with those of low genetic risk. And unfavorable lifestyle was associated with 66% increased risk of stroke compared with the favorable lifestyle. So in the end, changing the lifestyle modulates also the gene contribution, but also um, the outcome. Very important in this regard is um, microbiome. And I think everybody is aware of the importance of the gut microbiome in, into the health of the entire body. And there are a lot of studies uh, now into the microbiome and stroke. So this is a study from 2020 with gut microbiota derived short chain fatty acids that promote post-stroke recovery in aged mice. As I said, a lot of models done in animals are um, able to uh, give a better insight. So this study from 2020 um, came out with the conclusion that poor stroke recovery in aged mice can be reversed via post-stroke bacterial therapy following the replenishment of useful gut microbe, microbiome via modulating of immunological, microbial, and metabolomic profile in the host. And it's just about fecal transplant in, um, in these mice, reestablishing the microbiome and then improving the stroke outcome. And um, this is an article from September 2021. That's a very good article. Um, there is the link for the full article. What they done, they done a systematic uh, review of the literature regarding gut microbiome and stroke. 220 um, something um, uh, articles have been reviewed. Um, articles published in between 1990 and 2020. And the goal was to focus on human subject studies and then was further expanded, including animal studies. And they came out with different um, gut microbial communities that have been identified in pre-stroke, during the stroke and post-stroke, trying to understand what kind of bacteria are increasing or decreasing pre, during stroke and post stroke. And in order to understand how we need to rebalance the microbiome in order to have a better outcome. And the study concluded that, uh, so for example, they focus on um, TMAO and uh, they picked up that gut dysbiosis and gut metabolite, TMAO, involved in different stages of stroke may contribute to stroke development and associated outcome. And balance of commensal and pathogenic bacteria and optimal TMAO levels can reduce the risk of stroke incidence. And how you can change trimethyl monamine oxidase, it's by um, small dietary intervention that are restoring microbial communities and are lowering the level of this gut metabolite, improving then the quality of life for the individuals with stroke because it's rebalancing, if you look here, all these very important processes where this gut metabolite is uh, involved in vascular inflammation, in atherosclerosis, in steatosis, and metabolic syndrome, and renal dysfunction. So diet rich in prebiotics can shift the microbiome composition toward increased commensal bacteria thereby promoting host health. And metabolome and microbiome-based dietary changes focused on improving gut health may reduce stroke risk and promote secondary prevention. And changes are very easy to be done. The study picked up different kind of uh, correlation in between the sources of TMAO that are coming from alimentation, from diet, uh, what is the genetic and epigenetic um, marker and uh, what it's happening, um, how the TMAO can be increased or can be decreased. And we see it's increasing with omnivore, fat-based um, diet rich in saturated fat, red meat, lean seafood, eggs, and so on and so on. There are the com comorbidities where uh, TMAO is very increased 
And there are also medication who can increase the MAO. And on the opposite, there are other um, diets that can decrease the MAO and also medication that can decrease the MAO. This is a research that came from Purdue University, preventing a way to use gene therapy to turn glial brain cells into neurons, restoring visual function and offering hope.